All right, gentlemen, let's go. Yesterday we uh, uh, were on Perak Lam and Pudzuk Vav. Now, um, I just want to tell you one thing because we're talking about, we're learning, uh, we're learning in the Gemara, we're learning about the get, the get business and the, betro the betrothal and the rumors, right? We're talking about rumors. We're talking about rumors and, and the get. So I just want to tell you one halachic case that did come up was uh, uh, there was the, the chief rabbinate in Israel. I, they used to. I don't know if they still do. But any time there was an uh, any time there was an engagement, a betrothal, uh, in Israel, any time there was an engagement. So uh, they published a list each week of the various engagements. The, the rabbinot published the list. So uh, one day, one week, they published the list, and then there's a phone call. They get a phone call at the rabbinot. A guy calls up, and he says, "There's a girl, uh, Mazal." You know, Mazal Buzaglu, who uh, got engaged, she can't get engaged because she's married to me. <coughs> so the, uh, the Dayan, the, the, the rabbi, he says, listen, buddy, you can't go spreading rumors like that. You know, if you got an issue, come down here and we'll talk. You can't go, you know, what kind of mean she's married to you? So he comes down to the rabbi, and he says to him, listen, I had a, uh, uh, we were at a party a couple of years ago, and we're goofing around, and I took a cracker, and I said to this girl with the cracker in front of two witnesses, I said, Hareyat Mikudeshes Lee. And she said, okay, and she took the cracker. So she's betrothed to me. In a halachi betrothal, it means you're, you're, even if you're not married, you're betrothed, and you can only terminate a betrothal with a get. So they didn't know what to do. So Rav Yashiv Zatzal, at the time he was on the Rabbanut, he was one of the Dayanim, on the, on the Beisdin Hagodol of the Rabbanut. He was one of the main Rabbanut Dayanim. And so Rabbi Yashiv and the other Dayanim, they went down to the cracker factory to find out how much they priced the crackers at. Because what does it all depend on? If the cracker is a shove of pruta or not, if it's worth a pruta. So if it's worth a pruta, she's a, you know, and everything else checks out, then she's actually, they can't, she can't marry the second guy until, she, until and unless she gets a get from the first guy, and if the second guy is not a Kohen. So they went down to the cracker factory to find out how much, what the price is on their crackers, and it turned out that the, based on the, on the, on the uh, what do you call it, the, the, the ingredients and the marketing and everything else, it came out that it was less than a shove of pruta. Everybody breathed a sigh of relief. But then one of the day on him said, just one second, because in Israel there's something called VAT, which is value-added tax, which is 17%. They're trying to raise it now to 18%. And everything in Israel gets VAT. Everything in Israel. The, the water, the air, the, uh, uh, you know, the, everything's got VAT. Gesundheit. Well, what? Gesundheit. Don't worry, nobody heard it. The, uh, the, what do you call it? So everything's got, everything's got VAT, everything in Israel's got VAT. So then it became, a, and with the VAT, it was worth more than a pruta. Then the question among the Dayanim became, does the VAT, even though it increases the price to more than a pruta, is that considered an inherent part of the price or not? Now you talk about a girl, you talk about a get over here. And so they went back and forth with it, and eventually Rav Yashiv was able to cite a proof from a Gomorrah. I think somewhere in Sukkot, he cited a proof based on this Gomorrah that it is part of the inherent cost, and the other Dayanim agreed with him, and that was the end of the story. She had to get, she couldn't marry the second guy until, I don't know what happened, I don't know eventually what happened. You know, the second guy may have shot the first guy. I don't know what happened. <laughs> but at the end of the day, it made her into a widow. I, you know, I don't know. But at the end of the day, at the end of the day, you're talking about what hinges on a cracker. Talk about the hinges on a cracker. They, you're not talking about serious stuff over here. So that was the uh, that was what he called. And they 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 were talking about well, how much is a pruta worth? How much is a pruta worth? I'll tell you how much a pruta worth. The pruta can be worth. And if the second guy's a kohen and then she gets a get and he can't now you get the pruta means they, because he can't marry her over a cracker. That's a, that, that, that's how that's how serious it is. Okay, now back to the ranch on page nine hundred. So the Torah says like this. We were talking about yesterday about making uh, a nidarim, making vows. And the Torah says that if a woman makes a vow, the husband has veto power. Now, what happens if the husband vetoes the nidar? A woman, let's say she makes a nidar, she's not going to eat pomegranates for a month. And the husband vetoes it. 
He's got veto power. That's why the husband vetoes it. The wife doesn't know that he vetoed it. And then she goes and eats a pomegranate thinking, I'm going to break my vow anyway. I made a net or not to. I don't really care. I'm going to eat a pomegranate. Now, she goes and eats the pomegranate. The truth of the matter is, has she done anything wrong? Has she, done it? Has she sinned? Has she, has she broken her netter? She hasn't broken. Technically not. Technically not. Because the husband has vetoed it. So take a look what the Torah, how the Torah puts it. And Pasuk, uh, um, Pasuk Vav. It's uh, six or seven lines from the top. On page 900. If her father has, how does he translate it? If her father restrained her. Or her husband, or her husband. Hashem should forgive her, but her father has refrained her. So the question becomes why does she need forgiveness? She didn't do anything wrong. Why does she need forgiveness? She didn't do anything wrong. What? Because she, actually she intended to do something wrong. In other words, it, it, she, your, 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 intent, your intent was no good. You intended to do something wrong. That itself needs an atonement, even though you technically didn't do anything wrong. You threw a punch at somebody and he missed. Yeah. Or you shot somebody and he happened to duck and you didn't kill him. No, your intent was to kill him. Right? I, but I didn't kill anybody. No, you attempted to. It's just something called attempted murder. Right? There's attempted Avera over here. So she needs an atonement. They say that the, uh, the, the, the Chafetz Chaim, there's a famous story about the Chafetz Chaim, that some guy ripped uh, grabbed his wallet. Some guy grabbed the Chafetz Chaim's wallet and he started running. So the Chafetz Chaim started chasing him. He was yelling to the guy, I forgive you! I forgive you! <laughs> That's a story they tell about the Chavitz Chaim. So what they, there's, a, what's a, there's a story within the story. There was some guy, was some, some, a Jewish guy, was accused of something or other who's in a Goyish court. And uh, the Chavitz Chaim was called in as a character witness for the Jewish guy. So the defense attorney said to the judge, I, Your Honor, I just want to tell you something about this man. And he told him this story, that the guy grabbed the wallet and he chased after him, yelling, I forgive you. So the prosecutor turns to the judge, he says, Your Honor, you don't really believe that, do you? you don't believe that's a ridiculous thing, you don't believe that. So the judge says, whether I believe it or not is immaterial. One thing I can tell you is they don't tell stories like that about me or you. You know, where, 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 where there's story, there's fire. Right? So, 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 you know, that tells you something. Okay. So that's a famous story about the Chafetz Chaim that he yelled after the guy. So I, there's, I heard a, a, a continuation of the story. They asked the Chafetz Chaim, why did you do that? Why did you do You could have stood where you were and just say, I forgive the guy. I'm Michael. Where I am, I'm Michael. You don't know, why do you have to chase him to yell at that you're Michael? Why can't you stay where you were? What do you have to chase him for? The Chafetz Chaim said, because of this Pasuk. Because I want the guy to know, because if the guy doesn't know that I forgive him, and now he makes use of the money. So he may be intending to use stolen money. So he'll be liable because he's intending to use stolen money. Even though I forgive him and I'm giving it to him as a gift, I'm gifting him the money. But in his mind, he's using stolen money, so he's intending to do an Avera. He's intending to do an Avera. So the Chafetz Chaim yelled to make sure the guy himself knows he's not doing an Avera. Now you can't intend to do an Avera. That's why he yelled it. Okay? Now, one second. Now we're going to get, we're going to get, they're going to smoke you now. Take a look. Take a look at Pasuk Yud Gimel. Watch this. So again, that talks about the husband. The Imhafer Yafer Osab, it's in the middle of the page on page 902. The Imhafer Yafer Osam, Isha, Biyom Shamov, the husband, voids the, uh, what do you call it, vetoes the nether on the day he hears about it. Kol Motza Soseli Dereha, whatever she expressed as a nether, Uli Isar Nafsha Loyakum. Her husband is voided, Hashem should forgive her. And again, the same situation. A woman made a netter, and the husband void, vetoed it, and she didn't know about it, and she tried to break the netter. So the Gemara says, when Rabbi Akiva got to this posuk, Rabbi Akiva would cry. Whenever Rabbi Akiva read this posuk, the words, Isha hafeiram v'ashem yislach la, Rabbi Akiva would cry. Why did Rabbi Akiva cry? Two questions. A, why did Rabbi Akiva cry? B, why did Rabbi Akiva cry? Why did Rabbi Akiva cry? 
Why did Rabbi Akiva cry? He wasn't the only one who read this Pesach. Other Tanoim and Amoroim, before and after him, read this Pesach. They all learned Chumash. They all were Mavir Sedra. They all did Shtayim Mikra Vechad Targum. Why did Rabbi Akiva, why did he cry when he read this Pesach more than anybody else, number one? And why did he cry when he read the Pesach? So one of the reasons he cried, the obvious reason he cried, because Rabbi Akiva said, listen, for the very reason, he said, if when you don't do the Avera, you need an atonement, if you intend to do an Avera and you don't succeed, you need an atonement. So when you do intend to do the Avera and you succeed, you certainly need an atonement. Imagine the atonement you need when you actually succeed in Avera. You know, gee, I want to eat a cheeseburger. I just don't want to be religious anymore. I'm going to eat a cheeseburger. Just my luck, it happens to be Parva cheese. Just my luck. I can't even do an Avera properly. So, hey, you know, the, 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 what do you call it, the, uh, the, 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 uh, um, the, 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 it, so if you, if when you wanted to do an Avera, and you didn't do it, you need an atonement. So when you do an Avera, I want a cheeseburger, and it is a cheeseburger. So imagine the atonement the person needs. That's, so that's what Rebbe Kiva, that's why he cried. He cried when you realize the magnitude of responsibility that a carry, person carries when they've actually sinned. So, you know, we take a, you know, we, oh, well, I, you know, I moved some muktzah on Shabbos. Oops. You know, oops. Oops. You know, a person realizes, listen, I, 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 didn't, I didn't mean to do it, but, uh, but I did it. So, you know, it needs an atonement. So if you, if you actually intended to do it out there, and he didn't have it, it certainly needs an atonement. Okay, we're page, page uh, 902. So that's the, okay. Why Rabbi Akiva? Now listen to this. Listen to this. According to the Arizal, according to the Arizal, if you remember, on, on Tisha B'Av is coming up. And on Tisha B'Av, we read about the ten martyrs who were killed brutally by the Romans. The Asorah Haruge Malchus. We read it on Tisha B'Av, we also read it on Yom Kippur. According to the Arizal, it's not only that, if you look at the if you look at the liturgy on Yom, Yom Kippur, if you look at the, 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 the liturgy, it's presented as a, on Tisha B'Av, I don't think so, but on Yom Kippur, the Yom Kippur Musaf Davening, it's presented as a conversation. That the Roman emperor, the Roman emperor at the time, he says to these ten sages that you have a law in your Torah that says if somebody kidnaps somebody and sells him, what's the punishment? What's the law for kidnapping in Torah? It's a capital offense. It's in the Ten Commandments when it says don't steal in the Ten Commandments. So it's not talking about monetary theft. It's talking about kidnapping. You're not allowed to steal people and sell them. You're not to steal people and sell them. I once threatened my daughter was about seven years old, and she was giving me a hard time. So I said to her, you know, according to halacha, I could sell you if I want. <laughs> and she looked at me and she goes, yeah, but you won't. And that wasn't the script. You know, she was supposed to she was supposed to drop down on her hands and knees and grovel and plead, no, daddy, please don't sell me. Please don't sell me. That's okay. I married her off. <laughs> Every time my son-in-law turns his back on me, I just go, <laughs> so, so, so you, you can't, if you kidnap and sell somebody, the halach is, the halach is, it's, it's a capital offense, liable for the death penalty. So the Roman emperor says to the ten, he says to the ten sages, he says, in your Torah it says if you kidnap and sell somebody, you're liable for the death penalty. The brothers, the ten brothers kidnapped and sold Yosef, yet we don't find that they were punished. Never have there been since then, subsequently, ten sages at your level, Therefore, you are going to be the atonement for Yosef's brothers. And each one of them is brutally executed. Actually, Rabbi Akiva is, is raked apart, the worst, uh, with iron combs. That's the famous story of Rabbi Akiva. The Gemara says that he was, they, they combed his flesh with rake. They raked him apart with iron, iron combs. The Arizal says that these ten sages were a reincarnation of the ten brothers. And... Rabbi Akiva was a reincarnation of Shimon. Shimon was the one who had the idea to sell Yosef. It was his idea. He was the, he was the mover and shaker in the deal. Now listen, what, it's very interesting. How many people died from the tribe of Shimon in the plague last week? Anybody remember? How many? 
24,000. How many disciples did Rabbi Akiva have who died? 24,000. So Rabbi Akiva and Shimon, now what happened with Shimon? Shimon, they, he had an idea, let's sell Yosef. So they sold Yosef. They intended to do bad. And what ends up happening? He ends up becoming a king in Egypt. And even when they come down, Yosef says to them, you intended for bad, but Hashem brought it out for good. So when Rabbi Akiva reads this pasuk, at some level, whether conscious or subconscious or his mazel senses it, Rabbi Akiva senses that somehow he has a reincarnation of Shimon. He's the one who with his intent as Shimon, it didn't work out well, and therefore Rabbi Akiva is going to suffer a terrible agony. That's why Rabbi Akiva reads it in the crowd. Why specifically Rabbi Akiva? Yeah, unbelievable. That's what the Farshim say. That as a reincarnation, he senses at some level in his soul that as a reincarnation, he's due for a punishment over here. So Rabbi Akiva cries, that's one of the explanations. There's another Gemara that says that Rabbi Akiva, there are three reasons why Rabbi Akiva cried, specifically Rabbi Akiva. There's a Gemara that says that Rabbi Akiva was saying, was making, the Gemara in Kedushan says he was making fun of the Satan. Gira be'ene the Satan. He was laughing at the Satan. He says, you can't, you got no, you got nothing on me. Like Gary Payton said when he came into the NBA. Gary Payton played for Seattle. Remember Gary Payton? And when he came into it, he said, Michael Jordan got nothing on me. That's what Gary Payton said. Michael didn't like that. Right, Gary Payton scored eight points in the first game against Michael. Michael had about 36. Right, he didn't like Gary Payton. So, so, so what do you call it? The Rabbi Kiva said to the Sutton, Sutton got nothing on me. He, he's got no control, power over me. The Sutton dressed himself up as a provocative woman on top of a tree. And Rabbi Akiva started climbing the tree. But the Gemara says, how do you like that? Even Rabbi Akiva. And he got halfway up the tree and the Sutton said, you know what, if not for the fact that in Shemayim they announcing, be careful of Rabbi Akiva and his Torah, I would have made mincemeat out of you. So Rabbi Akiva there also, what was his intent? His intent was to do an Avera. And he got stopped. He was saved by his Torah, so it didn't happen. So Rabbi Akiva cries, he needs an atonement. Then there's a third time that Rabbi Akiva found the Gemara, there's a, there's a, in, in Maseches Smokho, it says Rabbi Akiva found an unattended body, what's called a mace mitzvah. And what's the halacha for a mace mitzvah? A mace mitzvah acquires, its, acquires it, you bury it wherever you find it. And Rabbi Akiva picked up this mace mitzvah and he walked, I think, three mil, three miles with this dead body to bury it in a more respectable place. And Rabbanan said to him, for every step you took, you did Navera. Why do we should have, where, where are you carrying it to? It was unintentional. And he's doing a mitzvah because he's getting involved. But you did something wrong. For that, Rabbi Kiva cries over here because he realized, again, his intent was good, but you messed up. If your intent, for intent, you mess up, so certainly for the Avera itself. That's what the, that's what the, 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 the pretty, pretty frightening, yeah? Pretty frightening. Okay. But then again, for mitzvahs, it's the same thing. Do you know that if you lose, remember, gentlemen, anything negative in the Torah, the flip side and the positive is always, not only you get the flip side, but it's always stronger. It's, always, it's even stronger. The flip side is always stronger. Do me a favor, you uh, sort of post a glam at Aleph now. Vaydabar Hashem, bottom of 902. Vaydabar Hashem, on Moshe Lemar. Nekom nikmas v'nei so me'esa midyonim, achar teyosef el amecha. Now Hashem says to Moshe, time to take revenge from the Midianites, and then you are going to be gathered to your people. Now remember, that's the Torah's turn of phrase. When a person's going to die, the Torah doesn't say you're going to die. It says you're going to be gathered to your people. What people are you going to be gathered to? You're in a grave, you're all by yourself. And this is an idea. What's that? His brother and sister. But they're in their own graves. He's not going to be gathered to them. He's going to his own grave. It, you're close, but there, when you're a person, a grave is a lonely place. Nobody's in there with you. So what does it mean you'll be gathered to your people? This is a sign of a soul, of course. Very good, very good. The soul is going up, and the soul is gathered to. This certainly doesn't refer to the body. Two minutes. The body that certainly doesn't refer to the body refers to the soul. And so fell mecha, and you're going to go now, and you're going to engage in the battle against the Midianites. The Midianites are going to, now you're going to take exact revenge from the Midianites who caused the Jewish people to sin. Okay, gentlemen, I have to stop here because I have to go.